All right. Um, I think we'll uh, get started here. So uh, thanks to everyone for uh, tuning in. Um, obviously, it's a uh, it's an unusual time, um, but uh, we'll give this a try, and uh, hopefully, it will be helpful for for those of you who've been able to make it. Um, so uh, just as some basic uh, frameworks for so Zoom does have like a special webinar mode, but we're not using that. Um, so I think we'll kind of try and do our best here. So I set it to mute people by default, um, which I think is probably the best way to start. Um, but uh, since I'm not having video of anyone, and I don't think we have um, the raise hand feature of the webinar system, um, if you want to say something, um, you know, interrupt me, uh, please just unmute yourself and, and say something. Um, I think that's going to be the only way to do that. Um, and uh, as as in a usual kind of, you know, seminar type talk, um, I think, you know, if you have a question, you should ask it. Uh, so yeah, I, I will. Um, so, you know, normally when I do these kind of workshops, I like to sort of structure it. So, um, you know, different things, different people work at different speeds for these kinds of things. And I like, like to structure it so that we can kind of be a little bit less decentralized uh, with the medium that we have here. I think it's basically going to be mostly me talking and showing you things and uh, asking you to follow along. Um, so given that, uh, you know, anything that adds interactivity, uh, I think is a bonus. So if you've got questions, please ask them and that will, that will uh, spice things up a little bit. Um, the other thing I want to do is, uh, given uh, these uh, were the circumstances where, um, you know, part of part of the situation is that we're all kind of uh, cooped up in our homes, probably, and uh, a little bit of social interactions are are part of the value of this. Uh, so I was thinking we could start out by uh, going around and people introducing themselves briefly, um, because there's no obvious order of people on Zoom. I'll uh, go through some names, um, but to get started, so I'm Peter Williams. I'm the host of this uh, workshop. Uh, my, I'm the CFA innovation scientist right now, which is kind of a position that we made up a little bit more than a year ago, where um, my job is to, you know, do, do things like this and uh, try and make sure that folks in the CFA are using technology to help them do science uh, faster and better. Uh, I'm also half employed by the American Astronomical Society, and so I have a different set of responsibilities about uh, the World One Telescope project there and stuff with the AAS journals. And um, sometimes I get to, get to kind of work at the intersection of those two jobs, uh, like with ADS. Um, yeah, I think that's uh, enough to start with. And so going down the list, um, Hui Kun Wang, uh, would you mind introducing yourself? Hello, everybody. I'm Hui Chun Wang, also known as Helen. I work in the AMP department of the CFA. Thanks. Uh, Peter Doherty. I'm an engineer in the Optical Infrared Astronomy Division of Smithsonian Astrophysical, and I work on instrumentation, detectors, and testing. Great. Uh, Katie? Hi, um, I'm Katie, and I'm a librarian at Wolbach, and I'm um, looking forward to learning about Condaforge. Great. Eric. I'm Eric Brownell. I'm also a librarian at the Wolbach. Thanks for having us. Steve Wilner. Uh, hi, I'm a researcher in the infrared astronomy group over at uh, 160. And I've used Conda on both a Mac and a Linux machine, but I don't really know what I'm doing with it. So I'm looking forward to learning something. Great. Nico. Hi, I'm Nico Carver. I'm also a librarian uh, at the Wolbach Library. And uh, uh, you might have seen the emails from me. I help organize uh, programming for the library. Um, uh, and I've used uh, Anaconda for a number of years, but never really dug into it. So I'm excited to learn more. Thanks. Great. Howard. Hi, uh, Howard, Howard Smith, like Steve Wilner, uh, an infrared astronomer and OIR, and uh, looking forward to learning something new. Thanks. 
Great. Federica? Yeah, hi. So I'm an astronomer in Mano Planet Center, CFA. So basically, I work on asteroid body orbit determination. So thank you for the seminar. No, thanks for being here. Nelson. If you're saying anything, Nelson, you're muted. Sorry, do it again. Hi, I'm Nelson. Uh, Nelson Caldwell in the optical division, optical IR division, optical these ground-based telescopes. I've been using Anaconda for a few weeks. That's about it. Thank you. Great. Giancarlo? Hi. Oh, hi. Sorry about that. Um, hi, I'm Giancarlo Romeo. I am a staff at the Wolbeck Library as well. Um, I'm just glad that we were able to do this given the circumstances. So thank you. Sure. Caroline? Hi, I'm Caroline Nowlin. I'm a scientist in AMP studying air quality. Great. Uh, Floor? Uh, hi, I'm a, a first year graduate student. Um, work a lot with Anaconda. I might have to leave in an hour. Sorry for that. Uh, it's 8 p.m. here, so that's the reason. Um, yeah. It's <laughs> a good I'm reason. Sorry. And uh, Vinay. Hi, uh, I'm Vinay Kashyap. I'm uh, at the High Energy Astrophysics Division. I also work with Chandra. I do solar and stellar uh, corona uh, X-ray astronomy as well as astrostatistics. Great. OK. Um, Thanks, everyone, for being here. And I guess uh, one of the things we've learned is that librarians are very interested to learn about Conda. Um, so to get started, uh, so hopefully everyone was able to get a chance to uh, do the uh, little homework assignment I gave you of um, just installing the Anaconda installer and seeing if you can start up the Anaconda Navigator. Um, if you didn't do that, it's it's actually OK. Um, but I'll start off by just kind of uh, well, they will get started using this Navigator program, which is a graphical interface to Conda. And um, in case you're less comfortable with the command line, uh, we can sort of get started with some of the concepts there without having to uh, dive into the command line stuff. Um, so that's why I wanted to get started with that. So I'll start sharing my screen and hopefully um, this will work. So if I do this, can people see something that looks like an Anaconda Navigator window? Yes, I can. Yeah, so there's a little bug with the screen sharing where um, it only shares a quarter of my screen, so the full thing. But uh, hopefully this will work. Um, so this is a Navigator when you open it up. And uh, so I just want to start by talking about what we've done when we've actually installed this Anaconda package. Um, so when you download Anaconda, uh, this you know 500 megabyte whatever uh, package of software, you install it and you create this uh, software environment that um, contains things like you see here, like Jupyter Lab, the Jupyter Notebook, uh, Glue, um, something called Orange. I don't know what that is. Um, so it's a big bundle of scientific software altogether. Uh, but I, the thing, the reason that Anaconda is interesting. Um, is it's not just this one bundle right now, uh, but it's this whole packaging system. And so what I mean by that is that, uh, you know, Anaconda provides a framework for installing other pieces of scientific software. So Python libraries, numerical things like, uh, you know, R or like the linear algebra libraries, NumPy, all that. And it's a framework um, that basically makes it straightforward to take these packages and get them installed in a nice reproducible way. And the real value is, uh, you know, not necessarily this one distribution that we've installed right now, but the framework that lets us do that in a way uh, with flexibility and uh, that works pretty easily. Um, so an important distinction to make here is that, so Anaconda is a company. Uh, they want to make money off of you. Uh, just Conda, C-O-N-D-A, um, is the open source piece of software that's the package manager that powers this Anaconda environment. Um, so it's kind of analogous to uh, GitHub is a company that wants to make money off of you. Git is the underlying version control software that lots of people use. And in both cases, you know, the companies are providing value, um, but it's important to kind of be able to distinguish between the tool, um, which does what it does, and the kind of commercial entity that's around it. I think in both cases, um, you know, we can be confident that 
the tool will remain available and useful um, regardless of what happens with the commercial entity. Um, so this Conda tool is the package management software that uh, talks to online databases of software and says, and if you say, hey, I want to install AstroPy, that's the thing that take care, takes care of the mechanics of downloading that package and installing it in the right place and doing all that work. Um, but part of, part of the uh, important nature of any package management software is that um, that community of what, where the packages are, how often they get updated, which packages are available, all that, uh, you know, that's not a piece of software per se. That's a, you know, that's a human organization. That's a community. Um, and uh, Conda works well because uh, the software uh, works pretty decently for its applications, and there's also a lively community around it. Um, and so that's one of the reasons that's taken off well is that uh, compared to other package managers, uh, it does a it targets the scientific users like probably most of us uh, in a way that's a lot better than some of the existing options out there. Um, so there are lots of different kinds of package managers out there. So I want to talk for a few minutes about how Conda works and why it's different than others and why it seems to be a good fit for the scientific computational world. Um, so you may see on, on Linux, every Linux operating system has a built-in package manager that's part of the operating system. Uh, you know, the RPM system on Fedora things, uh, Debian, uh, Ubuntu packages. Uh, so there's those kinds of, lots of operating systems uh, have those built in as kind of a core thing. Uh, Windows notably doesn't. And I think that's actually one of the reasons that Windows is actually extremely painful to use is that they, they didn't build this in. Um, so unlike those kinds of package managers, Conda is interesting because you can run it as an unprivileged user, just in your own user account, and you don't have to have administrator privileges. And so if you're a scientist and you're trying to install software, say on an HPC machine or you know, something operated by the CF here at Harvard, uh, usually you don't have administrator privileges on those systems. And so uh, the fact that Conda can do that and work without any uh, privileges is, is extra valuable for scientists. For things that are targeted at people who are running their own desktop computers, uh, that's less of an advantage. Um, another cut nice thing is that Conda is cross-platform. And the same kind of framework will install software on Windows and Mac and Linux. And you know, depending on what you use, that you know, most of us are using just one operating system. But that flexibility uh, is, you know, can be valuable, and it helps build a, a, the wider community. And especially when you get to things like the, the data science world, where depending on people, where people are in some companies will be Windows based, the newer companies are probably mostly Mac based. A lot of us are using um, Mac or Linux derivatives. Uh, that, that breadth is also, it's, it's unusual. And I think it also helps strengthen the community, which is a big part of why Conor is valuable. Uh, so those are the, the key things I would say. So it's true that Conda started out as a package manager specifically for Python programs. So uh, in the Python world, you know, you'll have to install NumPy to do basic numerical stuff or AstroPy. And so Python has its own package manager called pip, uh, which I'll talk about a little bit how those interact later. But one of the problems that people ran into was if you're just installing a random Python module that's just Python code, uh, pip suffices. But if you start wanting to do scientific applications like NumPy or SciPy, where those kinds of, uh, you know, there's a Python layer to them, but there's also a layer of compiled code. And the existing Python framework didn't work well with uh, pre-compiled code where you're, say, taking Fortran and trying to install uh, pre-compiled Fortran stuff. And Kondo is basically invented to try and handle those kinds of systems better. And because of that, um, that means that it also has the infrastructure that it needs to be able to install software that doesn't use Python at all. Uh, so just random command line tools or a variety of environments. So that's kind of the origin. But I think one thing that's really important to point out is 
for instance, like this Anaconda Navigator is written in Python. The actual Conda tool itself is written in Python. Uh, but even if you're not a Python user, it can be a, if you're trying to install some kind of compiled tool on different operating systems on different machines, it can be very useful for that. So I think what I want to start with doing here, showing you in the Anaconda Navigator, is uh, not actually this home uh, button here. So I'll click down to the environments one. And this is really one of the uh, most, I think, most valuable things to kind of get used to when you're using a system like Conda that might be a bit foreign uh, if you're not used to, to using a similar system. And the main thing is, so here I have a list of four different environments, each of which is a kind of self-contained standalone stack of some stack of software that's been involved. Uh, everything, so this base one is, you'll probably just have base. If you just install Anaconda, uh, that's what you get. Um, I have a few things I was playing around with before where the key is that each of these environments, because they're standalone, I can mix and match packages and change versions of things in a way that means that instead of having to have your one environment where, oh, I have to install this package, I have to figure out how to get to work with everything else, I have to get all the versions to be compatible at the same time, uh, it's pretty cheap and quick to create just kind of a throwaway environment. If you want to test out a package and you're using Python 3.8 and it requires Python 3.6, uh, creating a new environment that uses that is as straightforward as clicking, say, this create button. And, you know, I can call it like test 3.6. And um, by the way, can everyone read this uh, font size? Is that is that good enough with the connection that we've got? I can read it. Yeah. Okay, good. And so uh, here, um, when I'm creating this new environment, it gives me a choice of which version of Python I want to use. And I can just select 3.6 and click Create. And down here, it will say that it's doing a bunch of processing and turning around and downloading and installing various packages. And that will take a minute or so. And when it's done, I'll have a self-contained um, software installation with its own little Python interpreter, its own set of packages, and its own uh, you know, I can use that and I can install something and then I throw it away when I'm done. So this is a little bit analogous um, to in cloud computing and web services and in science as well. People talk a lot about containerization uh, where uh, Docker is the big software for that, where you can build sort of a little self-contained virtual machine and you run a service inside that. but compared to a traditional virtual machine, it's much lighter weight. Um, likewise, to create this little standalone environment, you know, it takes a minute or two. It's not that lightweight, uh, but it's pretty quick and it's pretty reliable. And so uh, there's just a whole class of times when you're sort of used to this idea of having to have all of your software installed in, you know, slash user slash local or whatever. And you upgrade something and it breaks something else. And, you know, it's for, it takes forever to rebuild it. It's a huge pain. And the fact that Conda lets you create and switch between these different environments where I can have one that's tuned to one project where I need to install a radio astronomy software package. I can have one that's tuned to a different project where it's some web stuff and it uses different versions of things. And, you know, even if maybe they would be compatible together, but I don't even, you know, why bother with mixing and matching those things when I could have an environment that's more closely tuned to whatever my task is. So if there's one message I want to get across, um, for this I want to, want to plant this idea of uh, these environments are very useful and getting to a sort of mindset where, okay, I can create one, it takes a minute, it costs me a few hundred megabytes maybe, um, and I can throw it away when I'm done. Uh, and the fact that a packaging system uh, installs software in this relatively efficient, repeatable way makes that possible. And so this is why, uh, you know, if you have software instead of compiling this package and compiling that package and trying to make it all work together. Uh, if you can, if you can get those things working through a packaging system, it really opens up a lot of flexibility. And uh, towards the end of this, I'll give kind of a brief overview of 
how you can package your own software if you sort of want to integrate it into one of these environments. Uh, so getting back to what's in the navigator here, if I go back to the base environment, so again, this is what you should have if you just install Anaconda. And what Anaconda, the company, does is they provide this base environment, which is preloaded with kind of like a Swiss Army knife of all sorts of Python stuff that you would use if you're a Python data scientist or just plain scientist type person. Uh, so over on the right here is a list of the different packages that are installed. Uh, you can see down here, there's 330 of them right now. And if I scroll down, you can see AstroPy is built in. Um, Bokeh is a plotting package. Uh, various Conda things. Um, Dask is a parallel processing in Python package. Um, so over here, I can type a search. Apologies if this cuts off the screen a little bit. So, um, you know, I can be like, do we have matplotlib? Yep, that's there. Um, I think, do we have TensorFlow? I think not. Yeah, so we don't have TensorFlow right now. Um, that's one of these machine learning packages. Uh, but okay, we've got Jupyter. So it comes preloaded with kind of a, a very nice um, set of, of, you know, your basic starter kit of Python packages. And so if I go here, so I'm just going to, oops. So this is where I install all my stuff and just adding it all up. So this is just, I'm, I'm cutting out the disk, disk space taken by this. All right, so that's 13 gigabytes because I've, I've downloaded a bunch of extra packages. Um, but it is so, it is pretty heavyweight. Um, so that's kind of the, the thing that they give you is it's all batteries included, as they say. Uh, so if I go down to this test 3.6 environment and click on that, So now the navigator, the screen will just show me the things um, once it finishes loading uh, that are installed in this environment. And you can see down here, so this is much more minimal. This is like a, a basic thing of just 21 packages. And so uh, if I add that up, so this is still uh, like 150 megabytes. So it's uh, not that lightweight, um, but certainly lighter weight than kind of the fully loaded Anaconda thing um, that it gives you here. So actually, let's see. If I try this. Never mind. Um, so here, there is a very minimal set of tools. There's basically just Python and the bare things that are required to run the Conda software inside the environment. Um, so if I want to change that uh, in, this, in this user interface, so right now this is a dropdown where it's showing me the things that are installed. Uh, let me check one thing. Let's get rid of that. So again, it's reloading because I've changed some things. So if I look to just a list of all packages, See the number number here is about 8,100. So this is a list of every package that I could possibly install in here right now. And so, you know, say I'm doing a project where I know I want to use AstroPy. Uh, so I can type in a search here and click this. And uh, if I clicked apply, uh, oops, sorry, I'm not paying attention to questions in the chat. Um, uh, Vinay asked about the environment. I'll get to that in a little bit. The answer is yes, you can change those things. Um, for seeing the description, some of these packages don't have descriptions. Uh, some of them do. If all of them seem blank, maybe that's some kind of bug in the navigator. I'm not super familiar with the program, but, it, but there are packages that just don't have uh, descriptions available. Um, so, uh, so right now I've checked AstroPy and said I want to install this. And say also want to you know get in on the whole machine learning thing, so I can search for TensorFlow, and there's a bunch of TensorFlow packages here, and um, I'll just click TensorFlow. And so I said, okay, I want to in this environment in particular, I want to install TensorFlow and AstroPy. If I click that, so 
um, the way that all these packaging systems work is you break your software into a set of packages and you say, okay, this, this package won't work unless you also have this package installed. Um, so there were only there were only two things that I really wanted, but in order for them to work, we need to install 77 different packages because there's various low level dependencies of all sorts of things going on here. Uh, so if I apply that to actually do the installation, uh, the software will go out to the cloud, download all the code, and uh, install it inside this environment. So this will take a little while because um, Packages like TensorFlow are fairly hefty. They have a lot of stuff to them, uh, but hopefully it won't, it won't take too long here. Um, any other questions about what you've seen so far? You can either say them out loud or type them in the chat. So Peter, mm -hmm. uh, so these environments, I mean, they, they are kind of like um, having a, a path variable uh, that you can limit on a case by case basis. Is that the way we should think about them? Um, yeah, yeah, I mean, so it's imagine if you install some software in a prefix, like, you know, slash opt slash chow or whatever. Right. Uh, yeah, if you just start up a shell and that's not in your path, then you won't get those programs. And if you add it to your path, um, then, then you'll suddenly have it. Uh, that is, that's basically what's going on. It's, it turns out to be more sophisticated than that because um, you know, when you have things like Python programs, they, they'll search a stack of different paths. And so the isolation is a little bit uh, better than that. Um, but essentially, you know, it's, it's, it's providing you an isolation mechanism that Fundamentally, is kind of okay. We're just we're looking for software in these places and not these other places. Um, yeah. So Howard asked. I thought Astropy was already installed. Um, so yeah. So the the key thing here is that if I click on this uh, base environment up here, so this is um, one set of software where Astropy has been installed already. And now what I was doing there was I created this new testing environment using Python 3.6, which is, um, it's actually not entirely disconnected, but uh, for, for our purposes, it's encapsulated and separate from the base environment. Um, and so I, so if I want to use AstroPy when I'm using this environment, then, uh, then I have to install it separately. And so, you know, if all you want to do is just use AstroPy, creating another environment to install it doesn't make a lot of sense. Uh, so usually, you know, the way it will tend to work out is your base environment will be the thing where, uh, you know, you've got your kind of, you know, the, your, your daily drivers, the kind of software that you're using all the time. Um, but at least if you're, say, trying to install a very specific package, um, which I'll uh, demonstrate a little bit of, uh, or if you're, uh, you know, if you have a specific project where sometimes something will need a different version of a package because you're using someone else's code and, you know, you don't want to spend the time upgrading it from, from AstroPy 2 to AstroPy 3, you can, create a, you can create a standalone environment which has the versions that you need or whatever the customizations that you need. And in that case, you might need to add uh, things that are already in your base environment to your your special environment. Um, so now that I've installed the stack of uh, software in this test environment, it's up to uh, two gigabytes. So if you do create a lot of environments, you can start uh, eating up your disk space pretty aggressively. Um, but disk space is cheap these days. I mean, this is a this is a great example of kind of the way that uh, the way that we work with software has changed because people have realized that disk space and CPU cycles and network bandwidth are all just like so cheap compared to a person's time and attention where uh, it becomes, you know, downloading a gig gigabyte of data and taking up a few gigabytes of hard drive space to make your life easier. Back in the day, that would have been a ridiculous trade-off, but uh, 
nowadays it's one that is often pretty reasonable. Um, so one more thing I'll do in this environment is I'll install Jupyter uh, just so I can show the uh, launching capability uh, that this navigator has. So Jupyter being the Python uh, notebook environment that's quite popular these days. This should be pretty quick. I've already installed a lot of the stuff that it needs. And so if I go back here, um, so this is a little launcher that the Anaconda people have put together, uh, which can be can be convenient. Uh, so right now, uh, up here, I've got one of these things where I can choose my environment. And if I choose, say, the base environment, they have some kind of predefined list of applications that are available in this environment. And so Jupyter Lab is right here. So if I click this, it will, in fact, launch Jupyter Lab, where uh, what we get looks like this. It will yell at me about a bunch of stuff. And now, you know, if I import AstroPy, it's available. I don't get an error because AstroPy is available here. If I import SciPy, same deal. If I import, I don't know, um, Netplotlib, all these things are just here. Uh, so this is, uh, if you're not familiar with Jupyter, uh, apologies. I don't think this is really the time to go into the details there. Um, but uh, the, the thing I want to demonstrate here is that, uh, so that was the Jupyter lab that was tied to this base environment. Uh, question, Peter. Mm -hmm. So when you, uh, how, how can you tell which environment you're in if you're in a notebook? Uh, so from within Jupyter Lab, it's not so easy to tell um, because the Python software doesn't natively know about that. Uh, it's sort of through this environment and say through your shell that you use to launch programs where, ooh, it says my screen sharing is paused. Uh, screen share, okay. No, I um, can hear you. Yeah, I think the screen might have been frozen. Uh, so I don't think it, it's not wired in to, to show you that kind of information very conveniently. Uh, so it's the kind of thing you need to pay attention when you're starting your software, uh, because sort of by by nature of the packaging system, you're you know it's a framework in which you install software, and so the software doesn't necessarily know about that outer layer. So it's certainly it's quite often it's it's quite possible to start getting yourself confused if you're not using the environment that you thought you were or something like that. Um, and so I've turned it off here, uh, but by default, if you're using the Anaconda stuff on the command line, it will uh, edit your prompt to um, show you what environment is currently activated in that environment. Um, and I'll, I'll show you that in a few minutes. Okay, thank you. Um, so I've gone here and I've told uh, the launcher to be using this different environment now. And uh, now if I launch this, uh, yeah, so superficially it will look the same or pretty similar. Um, but now I can do, or I should be able to do, and import TensorFlow. And this doesn't work in the core environment, uh, but this will work here because I've installed it in this separate environment. Um, so, you know, if you really want to know, probably somewhere in the environment, um, you know, there's, I see that in the conda prefix one. Uh, yeah. Um, oh, no, no, sorry, that's slash A. That wasn't. Yeah, that well, I've uh, scrolled this off the screen, but uh, if I, yeah, so conda default end seems to be some environment variable. Uh, so it's the kind of thing where if you really want to, uh, you can, um, because it is working by uh, floating around with, with OS environment variables, you can pull out that information. Um, 
but yeah, it. it's not something that uh, you know you can imagine like a plug into Jupiter, which would give you a little readout or something. Uh, but you know, for instance, if you're installing, uh, you know, Casa or DS9, these things don't pay attention. They don't even know about this framework in which they're operating, so um, they won't necessarily give you that information. Thank you. Um, Okay, so uh, that is the sort of framework for interacting with the stuff with the kind of navigator. And um, I've tried to sort of give an overview of the uh, conceptual underpinning. Um, I wanted to spend some time uh, showing how all the stuff works on the command line, uh, because a lot of us are, are command line users. Uh, so we'll bring the terminal up here. And uh, so when you install Anaconda, by default, it will uh, edit your shell initialization file so that you are using, um, so that the Conda tools are in your path in this so-called uh, base environment. And I think if I actually change this, um, do that, yeah. So um, now this uh, little base that it's added to my prompt is telling me that I have the base environment activated. And uh, when in doubt, uh, a command like which Python tells you where it's finding Python in your path is always very useful. Um, and so this is saying that my base environment is in this prefix. And so I can check that that's what I'm using. So there is a command line command called conda, uh, which controls all of these, uh, you know, everything that I've shown you before, you can do with this command. It's one of these sort of multi-tool type ones, like git, where the command has many subcommands. Um, so for instance, if I type conda list, that will list all the packages installed in this environment. Um, and again, there were 330 of them, so it's quite a lengthy list. And uh, so we have the name of the different packages and then the version and then the build identifier, uh, which is, so if I have a packaging tool and I package version 0 0.26.2 of ARD, whatever that is, um, you know, I upload that and people start installing it and maybe there's an error in the way that I've packaged it. Uh, so even if the ARD people don't put out a new release of ARG, I need to put out a new package that fixes whatever the problem was. And uh, this build number is something that I will, you know, I'll release a new build, uh, even though it's the same version of the existing software. And uh, in the particular case of Conda, uh, for instance, there is the ARG package that is uh, intended to be used with Python 3.7, but there's maybe also the version that's intended to be used with Python 2.7. And there might be different versions used uh, with different operating systems, even though they have the same name. And there might be different versions targeting different CPU architectures. Uh, and so uh, in this particular system, the build numbers start getting, uh, they end up having these uh, weird cryptographic hashes of a certain them. They get quite complex. Um, but generally, you don't need to worry about them. Uh, so conda list is one command. Uh, so there's also a conda install command, uh, which will install a package. And uh, generally, if there's something that you know that you need, um, you know, usually the package name is is whatever the straightforward name of the thing is. So in this particular case, um, if I say type conda install astropy, this will actually tell me that astropy is already installed. Um, so what it does is it goes to the server and says, goes to the cloud and says, uh, do you have astropy? So the output here, um, so actually, so I asked it to install AstroPy, and what it's saying is it wants to do something totally different. Uh, it wants to update Conda from 4.8.2 to 4.8.3. And so what's going on here is that um, because Conda is a foundational package of the Conda system, unsurprisingly, whenever it sees that there's an update, uh, it will ask you to make that update even if you didn't ask for it. Uh, in this particular case, I'm just going to say no. That's OK. Um, so 
uh, if you are used to using Python, you uh, may know that a common way of installing packages uh, is with a program called pip. So pip is kind of the Python, uh, the Python language package manager that is the original thing that was written, as I said before. It turns out to have some limitations that especially come up when you're working with scientific software. Uh, but uh, it is out there. And Conda and pip will play nicely together. So for instance, if I do um, pip install mc, uh, the Markov chain Monte Carlo program. So pip will do its thing. And uh, now if I do a conda list and page that output, it's alphabetical. So if I scroll down here, hopefully you can see that, um, that uh, conda knows that I've installed MC and it's got this little marker uh, pi pi, which is indicating that it uh, was installed externally. Um, so my general recommendation would be like, if you are trying to install something, start with a conda install. And if conda says, I don't know what you're talking about, uh, then you know a pip install should be fine. Um, I could imagine that if you like mix and match too much, it might start getting a little funky. Uh, but they should generally, for most cases, they should generally play nicely together. Um, so another, uh, so getting back to the environments, uh, an important command is, so to use one environment instead of another, uh, the command to do that is conda activate or conda deactivate. So if I do conda activate test 3.6, that, um, that will start me using this environment that I just created called test 3.6 instead of the base one. And you'll see that my prompt here, hopefully you can see that that's uh, changed. And so now if I do which Python, uh, I'm now using a different version of Python than I was before. So if I do Python dash V, that's Python 3.6. And I believe if I do this and now do Python dash V, it's Python 3.7. Uh, so again, in most of your everyday usage, you don't really you know, need to switch between things like this very much. Uh, but if you do have, say you want to test software on different versions, uh, or you just have some piece of software which has uh, finicky requirements, um, this is very convenient. And maybe I shouldn't go into this, but you might wonder, so okay, so uh, when I say which Python, uh, you know, the answer that I get is determined by the environment variable named dollar $path, uh, which in this case begins with uh, this uh, directory specific to the environment. Uh, you might know that if I run a program, it can't alter the environment of my shell. Uh, the program is kind of a child program and the children can't do anything to their parents. Uh, what's actually happening here, um, oh, let's go like this, is basically when I actually type conda, it's just like shell script wrapper magic that uh, in most cases actually executes a pro program called conda but for the activate and deactivate commands, we'll do some sort of like built-in uh, shell jiggery pokery. Um, so I'm just making this up, so this might be a bad idea. But um, so if you run a command, if you uh, if you give a slash in its name, it will avoid these um, special functions and just run the base command. And I think what there is basically didn't do anything. Um, so now if, so now that I'm in my test 3.6 environment, if I do say a conda list, I have this, uh, still lengthy, uh, but shorter list of packages that includes the things like TensorFlow, uh, that I installed, uh, myself. Um, a useful command, I'll deactivate again, is conda clean. So when you install packages, uh, Conda will 
download a bunch of stuff and save a bunch of data. And um, again, so here in my con installation, I've already gotten up to 14 gigs just with some of the stuff I've been fooling around right now. Um, if I do a con to clean, that will delete some of those things. Uh, there's different arguments that tells it what to clean. And generally to clean everything, you want uh, the PITY arguments. So con to clean dash pity. And that will delete a whole bunch of stuff. And now I'm down to 9.6 gigs. So that saved me some disk space right there. Um, so if you're worrying about that, the con to clean command is a useful one. Um, so if I type this, you can see there's uh, various other commands. Basically, OK, um, there's a few others. So you might have seen before, there is a conda config command that I used, which uh, will basically give you an interface to a few, um, to some of the kind of internal settings. Most of them you don't really need. But for instance, this change PS1 uh, thing will set whether you get this little uh, indicator out front of your prompt or not, which you might care about. Uh, so if I go back to my test 3.6 environment, so uh, the Conda ecosystem is one in which uh, packages are updated pretty frequently. So there's kind of two ways that people can approach things. There's one philosophy, which is kind of, you know, if you're IBM and you're making enterprise software and you have corporate customers, uh, they also have package management systems, but they are very reluctant to update things and very slow about it and very careful um, because they don't want to break anything that, you know, a paying customer has. Uh, people in the Python world tend to be more on the other end of the spectrum where uh, they'll issue updates very frequently and it's kind of the uh, Facebook move fast and break things model uh, where you know, the idea is, okay, if we stay on the cutting edge, then things will break, but at least we won't have this thing where I haven't updated my software suite for five years, and now I need to catch up with a million changes all over the place all at once. Uh, so for instance, if I do a conda update command that can update the software packages that I've got installed, and uh, by giving it the dash dash all command, um, that will update all the packages that are present in this environment. And so if I do this, um, it will give me this list of a variety of things uh, where actually um, due to some configuration I had, a lot of this isn't actually package churn in terms of new updates, but it's got this whole list of changes that it wants to make. And you'll see here there's even packages that uh, it thinks ought to be removed and uh, new packages installed where say, say I've installed AstroPy and a new version of AstroPy comes out and suddenly AstroPy needs some ephemeris package, you know, might say, okay, now we need to install that too. Okay, so I won't actually do that. Um, to get back to the navigator, if you are more comfortable with the graphical interface, um, if I select this base, So again, it's a uh, reading a list of installed packages where this is one of the things where, you know, reading that list should not be uh, super slow, but Conda isn't always the most efficient. Uh, one of the selectors I can use here is updatable. And these are packages for which uh, it knows that updates are available. And so I can say, oh, there's a new version of Bokeh available. And if I click on that and apply it will do some thinking and probably tell me that I have to install the new bokeh. And uh, I think I've seen this before. I think sometimes you need to click it twice. Think, think, think. OK, well, I don't know what it's doing there. Um, let's install. Let's update a few others, too. Yeah, so now it says, OK, I'll, I can install these updates for you. Um, so if you are preferring the graphical interface, uh, going through uh, using the selector to figure out what's updatable 
uh, is useful. And as a general recommendation, uh, because, because the Conda ecosystem has a sort of move fast mindset, I would say, you know, if you've got a proposal due next week, it's probably not a best, best time to update things. Uh, but in general, I would recommend trying to keep your things up to date uh, because, because as with um, the sort of enterprise software distinction, uh, most updates will be fine and it's probably, it's gonna drive you less crazy to like fix some things once in a while than to update and suddenly have everything fall apart and not even know where to start. Um, obviously, uh, your mileage may vary and it depends on what exactly your applications are. Oops, that's a complaint from the inspector. I think those are really the, uh, the key um, commands that you will use. There's a few things that you can do in the command line interface that uh, you uh, don't necessarily get from the GUI. Uh, so for instance, something I just discovered today. So let's see. So if I want to install Jupyter Lab in this uh, customized environment, I can go and say this, and it will give me some fairly lengthy list of things to install. Uh, so it's saying here that it wants to install Jupyter Lab 1.2. I happen to know uh, that there are recent versions of Jupyter Lab that cause problems for me, uh, so I might want to uh, explicitly say. I want a specific version of Jupyter Lab. Uh, so a common way to say maybe I know that 1.2 breaks things for me, but previous versions work. Uh, the way that you express that on the command line is a little bit funky. You have to uh, use spaces and put it in quotation marks. So if I write this, this says I want Jupyter Lab version less than 1.2, and I could also say NumPy, and I could say something like SciPy greater than version 1.2 or things like that. So if I do this, it will uh, churn through. And so now it says it wants to install Jupyter Lab version 1.0.2. And because the ecosystem is moving so quickly, there's kind of, there's only so long you can do this uh, before um, as other packages upgrade, Jupyter Lab might depend on something and the older version might not be compatible with a newer version of a different package and then you can't install it anymore. Uh, but um, in general, you can, you can keep things at lower versions for a while. And I don't believe there's a way in the interface to say, I want to use an older version or require a newer version. And uh, just as an example, if I do conda search Jupyter Lab, that will print out all the different versions that are available. And uh, you can see there are a lot of them. Um, this is actually uh, scaled up by a factor of three because for each specific version, they've got one for Python 3.5, one for Python 3.6, one for Python 3.7. Um, but still, you can go pretty far back into the uh, history if so desired. And so this is pretty good for scientific reproducibility where uh, if you, you know, say you've done a project and you've used a certain set of software for it, uh, one nice thing you can do is you can do conda and export. And what this does is it prints out the exact versions of all the software that's installed right now in a format that I can save into a file. Um, so here I would use it as, um, I would use a, a Unix shell redirect, you know, I'd say save it to uh, my test 3.6. And this is called YAML format, so typically the file name extension is YML. And say in the navigator, you'll notice there's this import button uh, where I can find that file and uh, recreate an environment that has exactly that same set of software too. So if, uh, if you care about scientific reproducibility and you say, okay, I've done all this analysis, I want someone to be able to rerun the code uh, or you know, use exactly the same set of packages that I've been using, 
this export and import feature is pretty good. Uh, it turns out it's still got some limitations, like I was saying before, because the ecosystem moves so fast, stuff that you can install now, you know, I could take this file in a year from now, it might not work anymore because of uh, things that have drifted under it. Uh, but it's a good start and, you know, that wasn't too complicated. As these things go, uh, that's a pretty nice way to be able to freeze uh, the software that you're using and, you know, even if it doesn't reproduce exactly, it's at least a very nice documentation of what you were using uh, that could be helpful in the future. So that's another uh, case where environments come in handy. So I think those were the main things I wanted to show with uh, the command line interface to Conda. Uh, anyone have any questions about that? So when we change the environment, do we always go through the base environment? Um, you don't, you don't have to, uh, when you, by default, when your shell starts up, it will start you with that base environment and you can't delete that base environment. Uh, so sort of usually when you're starting up, you'll be starting there, but there's no special need to activate it. If you, you know, if your position is just to activate the environment you want, you don't have to use the base thing in particular, uh, but it is true that, uh, you can't delete the base environment. Um, it's kind of the way things are wired together. There's always this base and then these other things are kind of sub environments of it. Oh, thank you. So is it uh, correct to think that other environments build onto the base environment or are they parallel to each other? It, it's kind of in between They're They're mostly, you can think of them as parallel. Um, like for instance, if something is installed in the base environment and I create a new environment, the base environment has AstroPy. If I don't install AstroPy into my sub environment, uh, it's not going to be available. So in that sense, it's not really inheriting uh, from the base. Uh, but it is true that if you kind of dig through the guts, um, things like the Python and the Conda installation, it kind of points back to the base where if you deleted your base, everything would stop working. Um, but the, the intent is certainly that, that these environments, uh, are, are parallel. I would say, you know, they're, they're intended to be parallel in terms of how you think about them. Then with the actual implementation, there is a little bit of a tie. Thank you. Peter, if, if I install and then that, that has requirements that are different uh than what anaconda has will it change my base environment uh sorry i, I missed the if you install um work, you dropped oh, that sorry. One you said okay uh if i install a package with pip and then that has a bunch of requirements for other packages and mm -hmm. they're like on different versions than what's in my anaconda base will it overwrite what's in my base or will it do something different um I believe what will happen is it will install multiple versions of the same package. I think, um, I'm not entirely sure, but I think that's my guess. Uh, but it is true that that is exactly, that's exactly the kind of thing where I would say like try to avoid the pip installations um, if something is available in Conda because uh, that kind of thing, I don't know exactly what happens, but it probably gets confusing quickly. Um, so because, you know, Conda knows about PIP, but PIP doesn't know about Conda. And so, um, if, so they will, you know, PIP can say, you know, if you have installed a package by Conda, uh, you know, there's version four of a dependency. If the thing you're installing with PIP needs version four, PIP will see that and be happy. Uh, but yeah, if it's an incompatible version, PIP will do something and I don't know what it will do, but, it, uh, probably isn't going to lead anywhere good. Um, so this is another example of, um, you know, why environments are so useful, where if you're in a situation where you know that that might be a risk, uh, creating a quick environment just to test it out and see what happens um, is, is, it's very valuable to be able to do that. And, you know, once you get a sense of what's going on, 
then you can maybe affect the alter your base environment or not depending yeah i'll definitely i'll definitely do that in the future because in the past i've i've gotten into situations where i I install one thing and then it breaks something else and uh, I don't really understand how to fix it after that. So that's yeah, cool. yeah, that's, I mean, that's, uh, so especially with Python where because it's a scripting language, um, you know, when I have a program that depends on some other library, uh, you know, if I upgrade that library, it might suddenly break my program and there's no real, like the, the safeguards against that are basically all in the package manager version annotations. Where it's like, you know, if I compile a program and it links in a library statically, you know, that's just, it is what it is, that's going to keep on working. Um, so in Python that, you know, that always happens where you install something and it breaks stuff. And this is, this is why environments come in handy, uh, because it allows you a lot more isolation to, you know, to upgrade things and uh, separate out those different uh, stacks of software. And if anything breaks, it's relatively easy to blow it away and start again. All right. Um, it's been about an hour, so I was thinking we would take a break just for five minutes and uh, you know get a cup of water or whatever we need to do. Um, so we will do that. Uh, so I have it as 3.06 right now. Um, so I will do likewise, and uh, we'll start up again at 3.11. Uh, I mean, I will actually be around, so feel free to um, to chat, uh, use, a, use the text chat if you have any questions or thoughts while we're taking a break.
All right, um, we'll get going again. So one last thing I wanted to show that uh, uses the command line that um, is a little bit of an extension is that it's kind of giving a general sense of the range of things that are out there. So a nice thing about Conda is that uh, the infrastructure is there for people to make their own packages. Uh, and as I'll talk about more shortly, uh, there's a lot of people have been taking advantage of that. And that's another reason why uh, Conda has been pretty good in the scientific environment because uh, people can contribute packages in a very decentralized manner. So in particular, if I start up a web browser here and search for Chen, Chandra Chow Conda, say, uh, we'll see that the recent version of Chow has a Conda uh, option that they are starting to test. And from looking at this before, I know that basically a lot of these instructions are about just installing Conda and stuff that I don't need to actually pay attention to. Uh, from reading this before, I know that here actually is uh, the fastest way to get Chow 4.12 installed if you're using Conda. Uh, is this command where um, the platform brackets there, they say over here is either Linux or Mac OS. And so uh, what this command will do is basically it will go to the cloud and it's got a uh, predefined place to look where the Chandra people have uploaded one of these environment files that says, okay, if someone asks to install this, uh, install that whole, this set of packages. Um, this argument to the create command uh, gives it a name. So you might have seen that I had a chow 4.12 in my list of packages. Um, and uh, finally, I'm not going to run this now because there's a lot of data. It's a big download. I don't want to saturate my video connection. Uh, but I'll show you a little bit about what happened when I did run it. So uh, this terminal here. So I ran this command, you get a sort of similar uh, output as well, the installer update things, and it downloads and installs all these packages. And you might see here that there's a lot of interesting things like there's DS9 and there's Sherpa um, and there's Chow Contrib. And uh, somewhere up here, my directory is so big because there's a gigabyte of XPEC models um, somewhere in here. Uh, yeah, yeah, 1.3 gigs of XPEC models and it just installs all that stuff. And then I do a con to activate and I did this without um, the thing that modifies my prompt. And then, you know, if I uh, list all the binaries that are available, there's all these Chandra tasks and DS9 and whatnot. And if I just ran, run Dambo Chandra obs ID, uh, then uh, you know I can start working on my Chandra data. If I do which DS9, I've got DS9 available. Uh, so obviously this is a bit of a canned example, uh, but for I think you're going to see more and more of this with observatories, uh, LSST, NRAO, folks like that, who are distributing these fairly large software packages, um, integrating into the Conda system. Uh, it's it's pretty tractable and it's uh, it's pretty easy. So I think you'll see more and more of this and certainly um you know once you're especially once you're used to using conda doing this is probably easier than finding whoever's you know custom installer scripts that you got to run and all that stuff and the nice thing is that uh i think so you know for instance nrao uh, casa their radio restrict their radio astronomy package uh comes with its own python thing but it doesn't come installed with astropy or whatever and if I install, uh, if I install an environment that has a package like that, just double check that I'm using the right thing, and I can check and see whether AstroPy is installed. And if it's not there, I can do a conda install AstroPy. Sorry if you can't see that. And I can add AstroPy to the recommended Chow environment. So. Uh, I would say just if you are looking to install any kind of scientific package, 
it's always worth doing a Google to see if there is a condo version available. Um, and so larger organizations like uh, the CXC will have things like all this uh, relatively fancy infrastructure set up. Uh, but other folks, uh, a lot of them are using what's called the Condo Forge project, which I'll finally introduce here. So as I said before, um, Conda is a piece of software. Anaconda is a company that builds services around that piece of software. And so Conda uh, is both that software and then the Anaconda packaging ecosystem. They're the people who make these packages of all these versions of things and make sure that you're getting a new Astro Pi. Uh, Conda Forge is an organization that's uh, decentralized and community driven that's uh, definitely connected to Anaconda, Anaconda but it's a, uh, it's a separate project to produce these kinds of packages using free infrastructure uh, that anyone can contribute to. And they do a pretty good job of actually achieving that ideal. Um, so the kind of the outcome of all that is if I go to this Anaconda Navigator. And uh, so right now, if I go to my test 3.6 environment, it will load up the packages. spin for however long it takes. So if I go back here and list all the packages down here, we've got about 8,000 packages available. And so, you know, that's a lot of different kinds of software. Um, but it is true that it's not everything. Uh, so for instance, if I want to install, okay, I, I installed MC before, so it's available. Um, if I want to install, I don't know, PyFM, do we have that? No, we don't. Um, so the Conda Forge project uh, has made a whole bunch of extra packages. And Conda has a pretty nice infrastructure where to use those packages uh, in this interface is as easy as clicking this channels button. And a channel is basically a source of packages. And by default, uh, Conda just has one source called defaults, which um, should appear here momentarily. I feel like the uh, I feel like the navigator is getting a little antsy here. All right, yeah. Um, so uh, if I were to use that interface. It would uh, give me a little chance to add a channel, and I could add conda-forge. Um, I'll do this in the command line instead, uh, just because I think it's going to be more likely to work. So the command line equivalent is using the config command, uh, where I do conda config, and I just know that it's dash dash add channels conda-forge. Um, and so that what this will do is this will say, OK, I also want to start looking for packages from this Conda Forge source as well as the default source. So that operation is quick. Um, and I guess I'll exit the navigator and restart it and see if that helps. All right, so hopefully this will be happier now. So we'll open the packages. That's 167 installed. If I click this, okay, good. Uh, so the GUI way to do this would be to type this add button and just type Conda Forge there. And so now if I go to the list of all packages and update that. So now it's going and downloading and getting a list of everything that Conda Forge has. Do, 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 do. All 
All right, okay, good. Uh, so now we're up to 15,000 packages. So we've nearly doubled the list of things that are available. Um, so if I search for MC, we've got that. We've also got what I assume is some parallel tempering version. Uh, if we want PyFM, we've got that. Um, almost, you know, Conda has a lot, but or the, the Anaconda distribution defaults has a lot. Uh, Conda Forge has like nearly everything. Um, you know, again, new, you know, 15,000 different packages. Uh, there's a whole bunch of, so if you happen to be an R user, by the way, uh, the, the Conda ecosystem also contains just about everything in the R language that uh, is out there. And, uh, you know, all sorts of uh, machine learning tools and Skyfield is a nice astronomy ephemeris package. Um, you know, just uh, all sorts of stuff. Um, nearly everything that you could want. And so uh, if you're using this interface, you can search for things using this box. And again, um, if you want it, it's almost surely here already. If it's a Python package and it's not, you can pick install it. Uh, likewise, if you're using the command line interface, you now I can do a conda search for MC. And now it will show all these versions that are available from the Conda Forge channel as opposed to the defaults channel. Uh, so another nice thing about Conda Forge is uh, that they've got tons of automation. So uh, like as soon as a new release of MC comes out, uh, they actually have automated systems that notice that and uh, propose a new, you know, the generation of a new package and let people uh, check it out. And um, you know, it's pretty much click of a button to package the newest version as it comes out. Uh, so they're very much on the bleeding edge of a lot of things. Um, and uh, you know, whenever you do an update, there, there's almost always uh, new stuff that's come out. And uh, they do a very good job of uh, they have so they build packages for the three major operating systems and different CPU architectures for Linux and uh, a whole bunch of different things. And so you'll see, if I just do a general update, uh, this indicator means that this is a package that came from Anaconda's uh, distribution and Conda Forge rebuilds everything. And so it wants to update all my packages and often you'll see, um, okay, so like here we actually have a version going down of uh, the main Anaconda distribution has 2.63, the Conda Forge is 2.58. Uh, much more often, you'll see version numbers go up where um, different uh, Conda Forge is ahead of, of the Anaconda defaults. Uh, so for instance, if you are, um, Anaconda updates very frequently, but will sometimes be the case that it will install it and will have a slightly older version of a, of a package, um, like just, out of curiosity, if I kind of search for AstroPy. All right, so uh, both Conda Forge and Anaconda's defaults have 4.0 already. Um, often, you know, the main line will be a little bit behind, so Conda Forge will give you the newer stuff. Um, so just to give you a little bit of an overview of how this Conda Forge uh, community is actually incarnated, um, so there is a website, condaforge.org, that will give you some instructions and show you how to activate it and uh, do things like that. Uh, the main place in which Condaforge lives, though, is on GitHub. And the way that their system works is essentially for every single package there is one of these uh, GitHub repositories, and they automate all the package creation and updating uh, through GitHub workflows. Uh, because this is not a Git or a GitHub tutorial, I'm not going to go into too much detail about that. Um, but this is, you know, public uh, coding infrastructure that many, many people are using these days. Uh, so, for instance, if you see a package on Conda Forge that's out of date, 
Uh, you can, you know, if you search it for, for here, um, like the Jaeger client, I don't, I don't know what that is. Uh, the readme will tell you about the status and, you know, you can file an issue. It's, you can file an issue and say, you know, we need a new version or this package is causing problems or whatever. And um, towards the end, I'll just try and give a, a, a glimpse of how you can contribute your own packages. Uh, so in particular, the way that all this happens is um, using or maybe more accurately abusing uh, the continuous inf integration systems that are out there these days. So continuous integration being this idea of if I'm using a system like GitHub and I make change to code, I'll upload it and they'll compile the software for me and run some tests and say, hey, your change broke our test suite. You know, we need to fix it. Uh, so what kind of Forge does is uh, they use that same infrastructure. What they do is they compile the software and they build a package and they upload it to uh, the distribution servers. So if I click through on these little things, uh, this is a list of kind of the different, they've ended up over the years patching together like literally four different free services to make all these, to make all these uh, packages. And if you click through, you can get the logs about you know, how the software was actually built um, and all the details of, uh, so, you know, this isn't of interest just if you're a user, but the point is that really everything about this uh, ecosystem really is done in the open and in the public and in a way where uh, you can get involved and you can, um, and, you know, you can suggest ideas and if you have the necessary skills, uh, you can contribute your own improvements. Um, so it's really, uh, compared to a lot of, you know, if I want to go to CXC and say like, hey, you need a new package um, in your distribution and you need to update this, I don't really know where to start. Um, everything kind of Forge is out there and it is logged publicly, uh, which I think is really important for um, being able to introduce people into becoming contributors and not just users. Uh, but the short story is you just turn on this channel and then you know, almost anything you could ever want uh, will be available. And when in doubt, you can use this kind of search command if you, uh, if you, you know, if you have a particular thing that you're looking for. Um, I think that was for the basic introduction of what kind of forge is. I think that was about what I wanted to say. Does anyone have any questions about that piece? All right, I'll take that as a no. Um, so I think those are the, the most important things I wanted to cover. There's a few uh, smaller topics that should hopefully be helpful, but uh, they're gonna kind of decrease in order of, of general applic applicability. So uh, hopefully you've seen that the key thing is with Conda and Conda Forge combined, almost anything that's out there has one of these pre-made packages so that installing should be as easy as a click of a button. Uh, there are times when it will break. There's a bunch of uh, ways in which things can go wrong. But uh, for a lot of existing stuff, this is as easy as it gets. And the environment's model is valuable uh, for both, both being able to the switch between different versions of things like that and throw things away. And also because we've got packages, it makes it easy to install things. Sorry, I just lost my train of thought. What I'm trying to say is that the value of the environments, I would say is such that if there is software that you want to install, it becomes worth your while to get someone to make a package of it rather than try and install it manually. You know, if there's one thing where it's like, okay, I got to get this going. Uh, if you can install all say the dependencies using Conda and then you just have to add uh, this one you know, package that has a custom build system that's some esoteric scientific thing. Uh, that makes your life a lot easier. And if you can get that where you have a package of its own, then suddenly all this power of managing environments, managing different versions of things uh, is suddenly available for that package. So if there's, uh, if you've got something that's esoteric, it's really worth uh, 
researching whether there's already a package available, often there is, and if not, uh, getting interested in, in the kind of forest systems for how you can make it so that there is a package available. Uh, so I will go into that more. One thing I wanted to show beforehand was I've mentioned a few times how uh, this Anaconda installation is pretty heavyweight by default. So I wanted to mention that there's something called Miniconda, which as you might infer from the name, is a lightweight download that uh, sort of gets you set up with the same framework, but without installing everything with all the batteries included. It's instead the much more uh, lightweight thing. So if I do a search for Miniconda, and click through here. So there'll be a list of these installers that are similar to the Anaconda installer. So for me, I would want Linux, Python 3.7, 64-bit. And so this will download, you know, it will be the same experience as the full-scale Anaconda installer, but it's only 80 megabytes instead of the 500 megabytes. And we'll unpack to that fairly minimal basis instead of the multi-gigabyte fully loaded anaconda tree. So for instance, uh, if you are doing continuous integration for a software package, it's often very convenient to use uh, the Conda framework to install your software's dependencies, uh, but you don't want to install the full-size anaconda framework because it's very heavyweight. Mini Conda is a nice alternative. And so if I'm getting set up on a new computer, which I'm logging into on an HPC system or something, Often I'll start with Miniconda that will get me going with the lightweight framework and then I can install stuff as I need. So, you know, to be honest, uh, prepping for this is actually the first time I've used the full scale Anaconda installer in years. Uh, the Miniconda one is, you know, I don't need all the R stuff. I don't need Orange, whatever that is. Uh, I just like to start with this. And uh, this is also updated frequently and they've got it for the three operating systems in both Python 2 and Python 3 versions. So it really covers most of your bases right there. Uh, so that's a very convenient thing. And then, so one thing, so I guess we'll work through it. So if I download this installer, so I'll save this, which is one of these things where the, it's an 80 megabyte shell script, which has a bunch of binary data. Uh, behind the behind the you know bin bash stuff at the beginning. It's not done yet. Yes. By the way, a little uh, trick, if you start using Miniconda a lot, it always shows you that license agreement. You can just press the Q button to not have to page through all the terms. Uh, so if I install it there, that will run nice and quickly. And then uh, because I didn't have it mess with my shell environment, I have to copy paste this magic line for bash shells. Now for the which Python, I'm using the Miniconda one. If I see how much disk space it's taking up, it's still pretty hefty, but again, lighter weight than the uh, full Anaconda installation. Um, and then I think if I do this, I believe what it will do is want to update everything from the Conda provided versions to the Conda Forge provided versions. So if you start using Conda Forge and you have an existing Anaconda installation, uh, there is always this like giant moment where when you start using it, it wants to replace literally every package in your installation. Uh, so doing that with a little mini Conda installation is maybe a little bit less intimidating. Uh, but once you're using it, you're just on the Conda Forge stuff and it's working and it works reliably. Uh, so that does get into a few of the, I just want to go over some of the little issues that come up when you're using Conda. So when you're doing a big uh, transaction like this in terms of uh, installing and updating and removing and adding a bunch of packages at once, uh, it is certainly possible 
that things will get um, wedged, is what I call it, where you'll get some conflicting versions and you know the installer will do its best to not break things, but sometimes the end result is just you can't update anything and your software doesn't work and it's broken. Um, so that's one reason to use environments because there is a non-trivial risk there. And if your setup is in a sub environment of the base, then, uh, you know, to blow, to blow away, if I go back to the navigator uh, and go to my environments, you know, I'm done with my chow demo. So once it reads it, I can click on the button and delete it all. And I think, you know, ideally the situation with an environment should be that, uh, you know, you don't feel too worried about the prospect of deleting it and recreating it. Um, you know, if you back up it, if you back up the package list with an export command, um, or if it's just, you, you know, you know that you take a base and you install package X, Y, Z, and the dependency management takes care of the rest. Um, yeah, like test one, I don't need this anymore. So uh, if your environment does get wedged where something's gone wrong with the package mix, uh, if you are really know what you're doing, uh, it is sometimes possible to rescue it. But one of the ways in which Conda is a little bit weaker is first of all, that that happens more often than one would like. And if it does get wedged, sometimes it's really just uh, it takes superheroics to fix it, and really, you don't have much of a choice besides blowing it away and restarting it. Um, other packaging systems, uh, I mean, the same way that Conda's kind of overall the environment is on the philosophy is more on the move fast and break things idea. Conda uh, does tend to be a little bit loosey goosey with some stuff, and there's maybe a fewer safeguards and things like the package transactions than there could be. Uh, so another pitfall, of course, is as I've mentioned several times, that we are chewing up a fair amount of disk space here. Uh, the conda clean command will help you there. Mini conda can help you there. Uh, but if you do create a lot of environments, they will add up. Um, which again, there's ways in which it could be more efficient, but that unfortunately uh, it is not. A uh, somewhat related thing that's important to keep aware of is um, if you're using conda on an HPC system, with a network file system. Uh, these conda environments, you they create a lot of files. And often that is pretty bad for uh, performance on these HPC file systems. So if I just do a tree command and just like print out everything, um, about 40,000 files. Uh, and that does tend to be the kind of thing where if you're doing a lot of that, your system administrators will get mad at you and so if you are creating one of these installations, um, just every time you do it, you're creating a whole Python stack. And Python being a scripting language just has a whole bunch of files. And so if you create it on a drive that's a local disk uh, or a more fast uh, network file system, that will be like trying to run a Conda installation off of an NFS file system is usually very painful because dealing with a lot of small files uh, is is just slow. So uh, not everything comes for free. That's one of the things that, that will come up. Uh, and then finally, because of this um, move fast and break things philosophy that we get, sometimes you'll get packages where the new version of the software just has a bug or there's an issue in the package and things just break. And again, uh, certainly if you have a proposal deadline in a week, that's not a great time to be updating things willy-nilly. Um, Usually things are pretty robust. Usually they get fixed pretty quickly, uh, but by the nature of the way that they approach things, uh, there are certainly times where, um, even, there have even been times when like a version of Conda has come out that has uh, had a bug in how it manages its um, solving the dependency problem and, and you, you get wedged. Um, again, there's really not much to be done about that just besides being aware that's a possibility, which tends to encourage, again, using environments and just being sensible about when you're doing updates. Uh, the last thing is if you install a lot of packages, we've already seen here. Uh, so say I want to install a new package. Uh, what the Conda system does is that package has a list of, okay, I need this 
package of this version installed. I'm incompatible with this version of that package. It basically sets up a big uh, Boolean satisfiability problem and solves it. And their solver is not so good where uh, it can become very slow. Like there are times when you're trying to install a new package and if you've got a big uh, environment and something is not quite right there, it will take it 10 minutes of churning just to try and figure out like, is it, am I allowed to install this package? It's a well-known thing that people complain about a lot. Um, personally, you know, it's slower than I would like in my day-to-day -day experience, but I don't have those really catastrophic failures, um, except when there's buggy things that have worked their way in. And as again, if you can segment things into a few environments, uh, you know, that will help you be more robust against these really catastrophic depth solver errors. Um, so finally, yep, time is passing. I wanted to show briefly a skeleton of how you can uh, contribute your own packages to the Conda Forge system. This will be clicking on some things, which is going through some GitHub operations where uh, if you're not familiar with that, uh, that is part of what you have to learn in order to be involved. Uh, but hopefully you can see a, uh, a quick overview of how that works. Um, so if I go to uh, the Conda Forge site on GitHub. So basically when you're when you're providing a package of a software in, of software in Conda, you have to develop what's called a recipe. And that recipe uh, for a lot of packages just consists of one file which is called meta.yaml. And this recipe provides information about the package. And so here we've got the name and the version is defined in a little macro here. This is about where we download it. And uh, this is a cryptographic hash of the source code file. And so this is part of the security chain where in principle, a nefarious party could replace the source code with something that had something malicious in it. And by validating the cryptographic hash, we make sure that the source wasn't changed. And we have, okay, this package needs all these other packages to run. It's a fairly lengthy list. And then we also have metadata. Uh, one thing that's important is that, uh, you know, every piece of software is an intellectual work that's covered by copyright. We're only allowed to download and use it because it's licensed to us under various versions. And, uh, you know, basically everything turns out to be illegal unless you actually keep track of what those licenses are and propagate them around. And so here, this is saying that this software is distributed under the BSD3 cause license, which is a standard open source license. And this is the file uh, in the source package that contains that. So, in a lot of cases, to create a package is just as simple as, or is basically the task of creating this file that defines everything correctly. Uh, fortunately, there are tools that automate that. So um, there's something called a uh, gray skull, which is the, the sort of modern tool for doing that. So I don't think I have it installed here like that. So if I install Grayskull, as usual, well, so this is this is when the uh, software. Uh oh, this could be bad. Uh, this is when the software is doing its. Uh, solution of the Boolean satisfiability problem. And if you get this kind of message, that's the kind of sign that uh, it's sort of heuristic, it's a simple algorithm failed, and so now it's trying the more complex things. So let's try. Let's try doing it in a different environment, which hopefully won't have the conflict issue. Yeah. So this one's going to spin for a while. Uh, for whatever reason, in my base environment, it's fine.
So for whatever reason, Grayskull has a fairly large list of dependencies, but it is what it is. Uh, so say I want to make a package for the MC uh, Markov J Mar Monte Carlo software. Uh, basically, it turns out that I just end up running Grayskull. I'm telling it to get it off of the Python index. I'm telling it to install MC. And it's one of these things which will have all sorts of fancy colors. And what's done here is it's created a directory called MC that contains this meta.yaml file. And it's filled it in with essentially everything that I need. Uh, it's figured out the dependencies. It's pulled out the license in the license file. Uh, it's pulled out you know, where the source code comes from and calculated the cryptographic hash. Uh, so basically, the only thing that I need to do is take responsibility for it by adding my GitHub name here. So in a lot of cases, if you're just trying to, if you have some piece of Python software, uh, you know, this will do essentially everything that you need. So once you've got that, uh, the process is the Conda Forge organization has a special uh, repository called staged recipes. And you issue a GitHub pull request where say these people are requesting to add a package called indicators and you add this meta.yaml file as part of your pull request and people will look it over and evaluate it. I'm actually a, a uh, core member of the Conda Forge team so I have the authority to approve things and merge them in and if uh, once it gets approved and they accept your pull request suddenly all this machinery spins up and does all the package construction and you know, an hour later, you've got it available to install via Conda. <clears throat> now, for a typical Python package that you can just install with pip, uh, going to this work of packaging it is not as much of a value add. Uh, but say, I don't know exactly what this package is, but they've their recipe here has a file called build.sh, and this is the commands to compile some kind of compiled code. And so it's using CMake and doing a make and make install. And the whole power of the Conda Forge environment is they have a very uh, standardized environment of, you know, things will be built, compiled using a certain operating system, using a certain set of compilers, using a certain framework. And so uh, this is, you know, it's a higher level of complexity, uh, but it's, there's a lot of examples to work from and it's nice and standardized so that when you submit your pull request, uh, these uh, CI systems will spin up and they'll try and do all your compiles. And this one is failing left and right. Uh, but once you get it going, it will just work. And so instead of sort of figuring out how to compile a package once and you've got it installed, and then if you had to redo it, you would never be able to recreate it or take you a day. Uh, if you do this and sort of get it in this canned recipe, then you've got it written down and preserved for posterity. And going forward, uh, it's way easier to get new versions when the software is updated or whatever it might be. Uh, so obviously there's a lot more detail to how this actually works in practice. But that being said, it's uh, Grayskull can get you going. And it's relatively, you know, again, anyone can file a pull request and submit a package. And then the automated systems are good enough where there's a lot of help in getting it to the point where it works. And then once it's approved, uh, there's a lot of automated help in keeping it working and just making it available to the entire community. Uh, so it's a pretty nice system overall. Uh, obviously, you need some skills about knowing how to compile certain things. And there, there is a learning curve to how the whole framework works. Uh, but as these things go, uh, there's a lot of emphasis on making it easy for people to get going. So uh, we're almost out of the two hours already. I've been talking a lot. So those were all the main things I wanted to show. Um, if you have any questions about what you've seen so far, uh, happy to answer them.
Hi, Peter. I have a question. Mm -hmm. So if I have two programs that requires two different environments mm -hmm. to be run on the same computer, is that possible? Do I have to run them one at a time? Or can they kind of run both simultaneously? So it depends on, on what you mean by running them at the same time. Uh, but in general, uh, you know, if you can install things in compatible environments, then then if you can get them in one environment, that's okay. And it certainly, it is possible, I can, a nice aspect of Conda and the way that the environments work is that, you know, say I have a program that's running in some context, uh, you know, a Conda environment or just using my system, you know, it's in slash user slash local, something like that. Uh, you know, I can invoke something in a Conda environment and, you know, that, that, invocation can be totally encapsulated where say I'm at a terminal here and I'm in my base environment. If I just, if I run a Anaconda three ends or let's see, do I so now I go to the show. You know, if I, if I launch a program in here, I don't know what the derb is, uh, you know, I can just usually just running that software will pull in all the libraries that it needs and all the dependencies such that I can be starting from a different environment and this will still work. And so uh, one, one kind of pattern that I use a lot is I need to run some esoteric piece of software and I can create a custom environment that has support for that piece of software and then I can launch it externally and all of those dependencies uh, will be pulled in and things like shared library versions and kind of the, some of the nitty gritty stuff uh, is taken care of uh, so that I won't get necessarily like library conflicts. Um, if you're literally just running the executable, that isn't always sufficient because there are these environment variables that need to be set up sometimes, uh, but often it is. I'm not sure if that's uh, fully answering your question. Um, but you know, I can certainly launch things in in one environment from a different environment, and in a lot of cases, you know, if I launch something that is home to environment B, it will just think that's an environment B, and will get everything that it needs in the right way. Okay, thank you. Another question is. Uh, there are so many packages, but I do not know which one does what. I only wake they know what I want to do. Mm -hmm. uh, how do I find out which package I will need? Uh, that's a great question. Um, I would say that, you know, essentially, Conda can't really help you with that part of things. I mean, it is true if I start up this Anaconda Navigator you know, they've got their list of applications, which have uh, various things and suggestions of, you know, okay, you know, they've called out, okay, spider, scientific Python development environment. Maybe that's what I want. Um, you know, they have uh, this environment calls out a few particular applications. Uh, but often, yeah, you know, you'll say, I'm writing a Python program. I need to do machine learning. Uh, I don't know where to get started. Um, and in that case, uh, yeah, Con Conda is not the place to get the answer to that question. Once you know what you need, uh, Conda will help you get it installed. Uh, but figuring it out is, um, uh, is this a thing? So some people on GitHub have these lists called like awesome machine learning. And it says it's a curated list of awesome machine learning frameworks. And so, you know, they have like, all right, what are some recommended frameworks to use in Python for computer vision? And they'll have a whole list of things. And you look at how, how long this list is and, you know, there's still a zillion choices. Um, so maybe this actually hasn't helped that much. Um, 
but uh but this is kind of you know it, it's for the most popular applications there are so many different options out there that uh it, it's it's a social question it's what do the people that i know use who recommend you know what's recommended by people uh what seems to be popular uh sometimes you'll kind of get okay i want to do something that combines these two features and what are the packages that play nicely with each other and that's a case where if you install something with Can conda and oh this package automatically pulls in this one uh you know one thing that does machine learning and one thing that does visualization um, then that kind of gives you a hint about what a nice combination is um but in general uh yeah it's not a you know, people will curate these lists, but it's not like there's one master list of the software to use. So you really do have to look around and, and you know, find something that's curated or ask someone who is a practitioner in the field. All right, um, well, uh, if I, I wasn't sure if we were actually going to fill up two hours, but so it has. Uh, so thanks, everyone, for sticking around. I hope that's been helpful. Um, feel free to email me if you have any other questions or things come up, um, or if you have any feedback about like you know topics that you would have liked to hear, see more about. Um, and also, uh, one last time, I'll, I'll plug that I created this uh, Slack workspace, which is kind of a nice chat type environment for staying in touch. And uh, you can direct message me on there if you'd like, and you can chat there. Um, it's kind of, you know, it's uh, hopefully we can continue the conversation a little bit. So I think unless anyone has any last comments, so I'll uh, wrap this up and I'll uh, send out a link to the video, assuming that uh, Zoom worked with that. And uh, yeah, thank you one more time for uh, sticking around.